brass sculpture of the Lady of Pain from the Planescape Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting. The character is quite iconic and she appears on every single book created for the setting. I'd had a go at making a version of this about five years ago but I wanted to come back and have another go at it so this is an updated version of that sculpture. Now in the last year or so I found myself being contacted by various collectors and fans of the game asking me if I'd either sell the original sculpture or to make a new one for them. So that was interesting but I was happy to have another go at the character. As you can see the original is looking a bit worse for wear. Now having made about 10 different versions of the character in the last 6 months um, I suddenly realised I didn't actually have one for myself so I figured I should probably get around to making myself a new version. In this video we're going to be looking at putting this together and then corroding the metal to get that lovely green effect. What I've done is to break the character down into its constituent parts and then draw around some templates onto the brass sheet. Now the original version was made out of very thin brass sheet which I was able to cut with scissors. This time around I'm making it out of 1mm thick brass sheet so it's a little bit more difficult to cut so I'm going to be using a bandsaw. There were quite a lot of individual pieces, obviously it's comprised of all these different blades, so it took a while to cut all these out. Now, unfortunately, no matter how accurate you are with a bandsaw, you're never going to get things exactly uh, correct, so I also need to file these down to size. Because the character is symmetrical, what I'm doing is to file two blades at the same time, that way I can get the same shape for both sides. As you can see, uh, it does create quite a lot of brass filing, so I did have quite a lot of this once I was done. So there we go, that's all the constituent parts. So what I now need to do is to join these all together. Now because they're all made of brass, what I'm going to do is to solder them together using a blowtorch. So here's my template for the piece, and as you can see there are quite a few pieces here. I do need to adjust a few of these just to make sure they fit together properly. So the first thing to do when you're soldering stuff is to give it a sand to get rid of any oxidation on the surface and any other contaminants that might get in the way of the solder. And what you do with this is you put some flux down on the pieces of metal. Where you put the flux is where the solder is going to go when you heat the pieces up. So what's really useful is to have some metal clamps to hold uh, the pieces in place. I'm just using bulldog clips for this. Because they're made of stainless steel they can take the heat um, so they won't fall apart when everything's heated up. The last thing you want is for these things to start shifting about once they're all too hot to touch. Now obviously if I start using a blowtorch on top of my paper template here uh, things are going to go wrong pretty quickly so I'm just putting a heat mat underneath and that should protect the template. So it's really just a question of heating things up until the solder will melt when you touch it to the brass. So the next step is to start adding some more blades here. One thing to bear in mind if you're adding additional pieces to some solder joints is that as you heat things up, the existing solder joints can start falling apart. So in this case what I'm doing is using the bulldog clip to hold everything in place. That does two things, it physically holds everything together, but what it also does is acts as a bit of a heat sink. So it stops the existing solder joints from heating up too much and the solder re-liquefying. Really 
So that's a useful trick if you're trying to solder things that are quite close together. Add some clamps like bulldog clips or pliers or something like that to the existing solder joints. And that should stop them heating up too much so that when you add some additional pieces, you can solder them without destroying the entire piece. I found these tweezers quite useful for doing this. What they are is tweezers that are naturally held closed. So you can use them to clamp things together. And because they've got a bit of a reach, it makes them quite useful for this kind of work. So I'm just using two of these to hold these two blades in place. So these two pieces can be soldered separately from the main body. So I'm just soldering them together. What can be quite useful if you're trying to work quickly is to have a uh, bucket of water nearby so you can just dump any metal in there to quickly cool it down. I think they call it a quenching trough if you're doing metal work. Um, I just call it a bucket of water though. So now that I've joined those two bits together I can then add them to the main piece. Once again as you can see I've got tweezers attached to all of the blades here. That's just so they act as heat sinks to take some of the heat away so the entire thing doesn't fall apart as I'm using my larger blowtorch here. Now if I were to be retaining the brass finish for this then I might be a little bit more careful about what I'm doing here. Once you've soldered something together you can sand it down and buff it to a nice finish. Um, but because the Lady of Pain's corroded and uh, beaten up I don't really need to worry about how messy my solder joints are. Which is handy so you can actually work quite quickly when you're doing this. Because the metal is already quite hot from my previous joins, I'm just using my smaller soldering iron here. That's got a bit more of a gentle flame to it, so um, it won't sort of blast everything apart um, and heat everything up too much, which can be a problem if you've got lots and lots of pieces joined together. As I mentioned, it can just heat everything up and cause it all to collapse. So there we go, there's the completed piece. Um, so that's all done, so I can now just chuck that in the water to cool down. Using the same method I've also joined these additional pieces together and that's the back of the sculpture as well and I've just joined those two halves together with a square of brass in the centre. Now as I mentioned I've made lots and lots of different versions of this character recently and as I've been doing so my understanding of the design has evolved. Now. I've been slightly hampered by some of the reference images I have, so some of the earlier versions I made weren't quite as accurate as some of the later versions. Um, but I wanted to sort of go the extra mile with my piece, so what I've started to do is to add in some additional detail in the centre of the blades. So putting that all together, this is uh, how my piece is looking so far. Now, as you can see, I've got a face here um, which is cast up in resin. Now what I did was to sculpt that up in monster clay and then to make a silicon mould. But the reason for that is because I just can't really make something with that much sculptural detail out of brass, at least not yet. Um, I don't have a foundry or anything, so um, we'll stick with resin for the time being. So now for the fun part, which is to actually uh, corrode the metal to get that nice green effect. So the stuff that I originally found to do this was something called Scopas Cupra, which I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this was bought from Tarantes, which is an art shop in London. Now they have since discontinued this, however there are other patinating agents available on eBay. And having bought some, they seem to be the same thing, so I think maybe Scopus Cooper is just a trade name perhaps. Now something else I add to the metal is this stuff, which is the flux that I was using to actually solder the pieces together. The reason I'm adding this is some time ago I noticed that some of the solder joints I was making were going green. So there's obviously something in the flux which is causing the metal to corrode. So in order to get a variation in colour, what I do is to add a layer of flux onto there, just sort of adding it on randomly, and on top of that I add the patinating agent. Now what I have found is that if you brush it on, sometimes the brush strokes can be visible in the resulting corrosion. So what I try to do is to stipple it on, that way I find that you don't get quite so much of an obvious uh, brush mark. So what I try to do is to sort of pull it a little bit, so it's not just a thin layer, but there's a bit of um, movement to it as it flows about. In order to get a variation in colour, what I've also taken to doing is getting some wire wool and to just scrunch that up above the uh, piece. What that does is to cause small pieces of iron to fall onto the metal. 
and that will then rust along with the brass. So what you get is a combination of brown and green, which can lead to some very nice results. Now the wire wall does start corroding very, very quickly. So in the time it's taking for me to just change the camera angle, you can see that the wire wall has already started going sort of ready orange. So here's a time lapse over a couple of hours of the metal corroding. You can see you get some very, very vivid colours with this. So it is quite fun just to experiment. Now I noticed in the original version that I have some quite blue areas. And I had started to add table salts to this as well. I'm not entirely sure if the table salt does anything chemically. Nevertheless, I think it's worth experimenting with different compounds and different chemicals to see the sort of effects you can get. As you can see here, there's a really wide variety of effects. So it really is worth having a play. One thing I did notice with the original model is that after a couple of years, I noticed that there started to be little piles of sort of green powder underneath the sculpture. And what was happening was that the corrosion was actually dropping off the metal, so it's not actually attached. So what I've taken to doing is to use some spray varnish to give this a coat to actually hold everything in place. So here's the corroded metal, and as you can see, I might have gone a little bit too heavy with the wire wool. Maybe should have put a bit less of that on, so some very large areas of brown. But I don't think that looks too bad, particularly once I get the face painted up. Um, there should be more green in the sculpture than brown, so I think that should help balance everything out. So all I'm doing now is attaching everything together with some bolts and some screws. And that's all going to fit together like that. Now, of course, I've only sculpted the lower portion of the face, so I need to actually uh, re-sculpt the top, incorporating all of the metal blades. So what I'm using to do that is a combination of Bondo to fill in the larger areas, and then I'm going over the top with a layer of Milliput, which I can sculpt down uh, just using some water to smooth it out. So that's quite an effective way of filling in all those gaps. And the last bit that remains is for me to super glue on the uh, forehead blades and the little sort of headdress bit there as well. So that's now ready for painting. So I'm just giving it a base coat of green first off. Now what I try to do with this is use a similar philosophy to the patination of the metal. Then I'm adding some thinner to it to allow the paints to naturally flow together. So I'm hoping that will create a similar effect to the random nature of the patination of the metal as the paints flow together. Um, what I'm now using is this stuff which is from Games Workshop and it's called uh, Nihilac Oxide I think. It's basically a paint version of the uh, verdigris colour you often see on statues and things. And this is almost like a wash, it's slightly translucent, so I found this stuff really, really useful. So all I'm doing is just dabbing it on and allowing it to flow down the face. As though this thing's been exposed to rain for many, many years and the uh, corrosion sort of run down its face as the rain's flowed over it. So I think that's looking quite nice. Um, you've got to obviously match it to the existing corrosion. The cool thing with this is because I've given this a layer of varnish, I can actually paint over the corrosion if I want to, and maybe just add in some paint here and there to sort of fully tie the paint on the face with the actual corrosion on the blade. So perhaps if there isn't quite as much nice bright green as you might want, you can go and add that in at various points to sort of bring the colour scheme of the piece together. <laughs> 
Now, one thing I don't have at the minute is some browns in there. Obviously, there's quite a lot of uh, brown corrosion in the metal, so I need to replicate that in the paint scheme too. So I'm going to use this stuff again from Games Workshop called a Rakeland Flesh Shade. Um, I've used this stuff for, for years and years. Basically, anything you put it on looks awesome afterwards. It's basically a brown wash, um, which is really, really useful. I often use brown washes of oil paints on some uh, models that I've used. This stuff sort of does a very, very similar job, and I found that quite a nice effect here is to put some in the eyes and then blow on the model so that it flows down the face and makes it look a bit like tears. So you don't want to go too heavy with this but it really does add a certain something to the sculpture I've found. So there we go, that's pretty much all the paint that I need to do. Now the last thing to do obviously is to corrode these last brass pieces that haven't yet been corroded. So I'm just going to add some additional patination agent to that to get that done. So there's my finished sculpture. I hope this has proved interesting. Patination techniques are a very interesting way of adding colour to metals and it's something that I've enjoyed experimenting with quite a lot on other pieces too. Anyway, that's it from me, so thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching. I'll be posting videos on future projects, so if you'd like to keep up with what's going on, please do subscribe. Alternatively, you can visit my website, which is www.thedarkpower.com, or you can find me on Facebook, just search for The Dark Power.